Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming to our uh, weekly seminar. Uh, so we are delighted today to have uh, Zoe Jung, who is a senior biostatistician here at in, uh, in the Value Institute at Christian Care, as well as a research assistant professor at Jefferson, to uh, give us a follow-up on the lecture that he gave last week on a propacity score, and that's something that we use a lot in our observational data. So thank you so much, Uwe, for coming back and giving us another talk. Thank you very much, Claudia, for your introduction. As Ed advertised last Friday, today I'm going to continue to talk about how can we use propacity score technology to address the selection bias in observational studies. Into this lecture, I'm going to focus on some specific uh, approaches, including like uh, inverse probability weighting and the uh, propensity score in bootstrapping to address uh, the selection bias raised in observational studies. I will use I will continue to use a application example last Friday I mentioned in Ether. Also, I would like to use another example which is, which is involved a smaller sample size so that I will um, illustrate how can we use um, propensity scores specifically using IPW and PSBB to address the imbalance for observational study. Um, to refresh your memory, I would like to um, see the, our basic notation. We use T to indicate the treatment group, we use Y to indicate the um, observational outcomes, and uh, we use X to indicate the baseline covariance so that our data set will be outcome um, treatment and uh, um, uh, covariance. As I, as I mentioned last uh, Friday, we defined the uh, propensity score as a conditional probability that a subject receives treatment or exposure or intervention, giving observational covariance. So that we can use a simple logistic regression to get a propensity score. And um, the basic question last Friday we saw is that for the propensity score, we do we require a lot of overlap in distribution of propensity score so that we can use the overlap the the overlap uh, propensity score to match treatment and the control uh, exposure versus non exposure and so on. But the problem is that not always not all of the observational studies can provide us a very large sample of patients. Maybe some observational studies can just give us pretty small sample size. If we would like to match in terms of propensity score, it is possible for us to know a lot of uh, very important uh, patients. So this is the reason why, in addition to uh, propensity matching, we have to uh, look at uh, some other technologies so that we can use as many um, information from the patients as possible. So, so, this so when you say there has to be significant overlap, do you mean that there has to be overlap in a variable, not that there has to be overlap in the result for the variable. Okay, when I... Just that you have the measure that you can assign, determine whether or not they, they, where they were on that variable. Okay, very good question. And um, when I say the overlap in, in last Friday and today, I mean, uh, when we look at the distribution of Professor Disagree in terms of treatment group, mm -hmm. we see the overlap the distribution of propensity score among two uh, treatment groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, 
so the purpose, as I just mentioned last time, of propensity score is to artificially balance the sample size in terms of covariance. So we, we have like a regression, stratification, matching, and uh, weighting. And then uh, last uh, Friday, we talked about uh, how to use match technology. Today, I will focus on weighting and also related to stratification. We will see how can we use weighting and stratification to we use the preference list score. When we see if the first technology I would like to talk about it today is inverse probability weighting. So when we see the inverse, which means we use the propensity score um, as a inverse to get a weight. So the weight first is a computed to that denote the probability of receiving a treatment, which is just the propensity score. And when we say the IPW, P means the propensity, I means inverse, which means for the subjects in, in treatment group, we use the a one over propensity score, which is the inverse of the propensity, to give a weight for treatment, for give a weight for the subjects in treatment. And we give the one minus the propensity score, and then inverse it to give a weight for control, exposure, or intervention or non-intervention group. So this is the reason why this weighting method is called inverse probability weighting. And here we should be careful for the uh, subjects in treatment, the inverse is just the one over propensity score. And for the control, the denominator is one minus the propensity score. And then we take the inverse as the weight. So this is the name and come, this is why we call this method is the inverse probability weighting. And after that, we have to normalize or standardize the weight. Okay, after we use in this IPW, which means one over propensity score as a weight for subjects in treatment group, one over the difference between one minus Propensity score as a weight for uh, subjects in control, because non exposure or non conventional group. And then we can estimate the effect of treatment um, outcomes. So the outcome is just the estimate of you know, something we are interested in, like uh, death mortality rate or other um, uh, things like a length of stay. And then for the mean outcome in the treatment group is just the sum of uh, the outcomes weighted by propensity, weighted by the inverse propensity weight divided by the standardized weight. And then for the control group, we just use the, the one minus the propensity score as a denominator. And then we take this uh, control group divided by the standardized uh, um, denominator. And, and then we can get uh, the effect of treatment. Uh, um, so this is the basic uh, uh, theoretical ideas about the effect of treatment by inverse for propensity weight. So the ideas is not so complicated. And uh, you just pay close attention for how to calculate the weight for uh, the patients in different groups. If we have more than two groups, like we would like to compare uh, like a cabbage, PCI, or medication, we can set up one group as a reference group, and then we calculate the propensity score. Any questions so far? Okay, I would like to use an um, example I mentioned last Friday effort to illustrate how can we use IPW, uh, inverse propensity score to um, address the selection bias. Um, 
last Friday, I talked about some background and study designing for S3. So this time, I, will, I would not to repeat it. In our S3, we use um, uh, the inverse probability weighting, which um, was based upon the probability score as the primary tool to adjust for differences between the PCI and the KBG treatment groups. So as I mentioned last time, we first get the propensity score, which is the probability for patients who get cabbage for patients in both cabbage group and the PCI group. And then we verified the performance of propensity score model by comparing the distribution of covariance and the propensity score between treatment groups before and after IPW weighting. So this is the basic results we obtained by using um, IPW. We can see that before we use IPW, which is the unadjusted data, as, I, uh, as we already see, um, we already saw last Friday, all of the covariance were not balanced. After we use IPW, we can see all of the important baseline covariance for balance. So this is the, the main advantage, one of the main advantages by using IPW to get the balanced um, results. Last time we talked about we using the matched data. We can compare the results from either matched data and the IPW. We can see that for each method, either matched data or IPW method, all of the most important covariance were balanced. This is the one thing. Another thing is that what is the advantage and the disadvantage for IPW and the matched data? And more people in IPW. Yes, this is the very important thing because we use all of the patients from our patient, patient population. So this is the one of the reasons why we should use IPW. But in recent decades, it seems like in, at least in medical literature, researchers prefer to use matched data. So in this study, we used both method to address the selection bias and see um, the results. So the basic result, so, so the basic result uh, was that by using the different method, one, this is a genetic population with um, matched data set, which is making like uh, researchers feel more comfortable because. Uh, because, the, because for this one, it seems like we have the equal size, equal um, uh, patient size in each treatment group. And it uh, seems like this matches the, the data um, looks like more closer to clinical trial. So th this is more like a, a pseudo or semi-clinical trial. But on the other hand, people will think that, OK, you use matched data, you get a very um, a, like a satisfied result, but you lost a lot of patients. If we can conclude all of the patients, what would happen? So we use the IPW. So this is the reason we can like see the trade-off between IPW and the matched data. Also, we can look at uh, uh, the um, a mortality rate of survival for the, the, the PCI and the um, KBG group. So this is the result from an uh, unadjusted analysis. We can see that compared to PCI, the KBG procedure didn't show or didn't show the, the advantage within a short time period. But, we, but in the long run, we can say the cabbage has a higher rate of survival. So this is the basic result. And then if we look at the results um, 
uh, adjusted by IPW, we can see the basic trend are the same, but the, general, but the magnitude has been, has been changed. So, the, so this is the uh, uh, IPW application in large observational studies. Now, let's then turn to the application of IPW in a small sample size. This uh, study is from um, our question, our VI Institute is an ongoing project. Um, we, are, we were looking at the, the sepsis inverse project. For a severe sepsis, we have some non-invasive and invasive procedures. So we would like to look at the comparative effectiveness of associated outcomes, including mortality rate and other um, outcomes. So th this is a real perspective um, studies from a registration data set. The, the purpose for this sepsis is to perform a comparative effectiveness for maternity associated with non-inversive versus inversive strategies for sepsis um, for severe sepsis, and uh, we use a prior score to look at the unifying. Uh, compared to effort, in this study, our um, sample size was comparatively small. We only have, originally we have 468 um, patients, and then after doing some criterion, we, we only have about 397 patients. Among that, 61% patients uh, were in the inversive pathway and uh, the, about 40% patients in the non-inversive pathway. So if we look at say that, uh, different from the, from the balance situation in ethered, we can see that in our sepsis study, for the baseline coherence, we have some already balanced, and uh, we have some uh, covariance not balanced. So since this is a uh, observational studies, we applied propensity score. So they say this is the propensity score distribution for invasive procedures in the invasive and the non-invasive patients. The, on, the, on the one hand, we can see that since the propensity score um, is the probability of uh, receiving invasive procedure, so it, it's not a surprise for invasive patients, we get a larger propensity score. And for the long invasive patients, comparatively get a small uh, value of propensity score. But as um, Sandy just mentioned, if we look at uh, the overlap, for the two groups, we can see that not patients, not many patients had an overlap propensity score. So, which means if in a very large observational studies like Ethert, we can get a pretty large matched sample size. But our study for this sepsis only had about um, 397 patients. So, if, okay, this is um, another way to look at uh, our propensity score. We have the C index is 0.82, which means our um, logistic regression model for calculating the propensity score should be pretty good, which means pretty good ob ability to distinguish between the two uh, procedure groups. If we use one-to-one -one match without a replacement, and then we would we look at the three or more decimal propensity score matching, we only can get 44 patients in each group. I took it away because there wasn't much overlap because they were in the invasive versus non-invasive by their propensity scores. Yes, the propensity scores differ too much. Yes. Yes. 
yeah, you are right. So we can see that. So this is the distribution of propensity score for both uh, groups. It's only in a couple categories of propensity scores too. It's in the middle. Yeah, just in the so, middle. So you don't have you're gonna at the extremes. You're gonna have a real problem. Yeah. So if we um, you match the data to analyze, to analyze uh, this um, data set. And the results, I should say, could be very misleading. So we decided that for this observational study, the match the data analysis not appropriate. So we use IPW, and then we can see that, that the, the, the basic change. We can see for this um, um, uh, synthetic um, hypertension, Okay, here is the p-value less than 0.05, and here is 0.03. And for this pair score, we, we get a balance after we use IPW. And for this sofa score, we get a balance after uh, using IPW. And here, for this risk uh, processor utilization, we balance the after by using and IPW. So we can say that for this small sample size, um, we, uh, we uh, improve the balance for baseline covariance, but not too much, not as good as, uh, as, good as uh, the results in a third. So we can say that, so the larger the sample size, the better propensity support method, which means for the large sample size, it's easier to get the balance for observed covariance. With a small sample size, it's reasonable to conclude that no matter what kind of uh, um, method you would like to try, uh, imbalance, I should say, could not be involved. So this is the reason uh, that, that we should be very careful for the observational studies. When the sample size is too small, maybe we need to continue to collect the all data, collect the larger data. So this is the um, one result. Okay, for the main results is the mortality rate. We use the um, Kaplan-Meier survival curve. So part A, plot A, is the results from the non-IPW um, adjusted um, uh, results. And uh, we can see that the um, cognitive survival rate is 0.59 versus 0.7 with p-value 0.94. After using IPW method, we get uh, the adjusted uh, survival rate in non-invasive with 0.1 and the invasive with 0.3 and then um, closer. And the basic conclusion is similar, which means no significant difference between invasive procedure and the non-invasive procedure. And the purpose of this study is to verify this hypothesis, which because there are no um, hypotheses like that for this uh, severe uh, sepsis, and uh, they should um, they should have no. Uh, Significant as the statistical difference between invasive procedure versus non-invasive procedure, and uh, uh, I would like to say by using IPW, this hypothesis um, was further verified. So this is um, um, today's first method by using IPW to address selection bias. I give two examples. One is with larger um, uh, observation um, patients' uh, sample size, and another with a small sample size. Now let's move on to propensity score beam bootstrapping. Okay, the, and uh, this method for me to further use the propensity score to address selection bias is for the non-traditional statistical issues, specifically for health economics. Because for health economics in observational studies, we have to adjust the selection bias. And at the same time, the distribution of cost basically 
uh, don't follow the normal, normal distribution. And we have to uh, um, modeling outcomes using non distributed non normal distributed uh, the patient level data set. So we should combine selection bias, resampling, and uh, modeling outcomes. Okay. So this is the reason why we use propensity score beam bootstrapping. Propensity score beam bootstrapping has very strong theoretical background to support, which means if we use some stratification, we can significantly reduce the selection bias. So, the, so, the, so the, 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 this is the main result, the, percent, the percent reduction in bias in a, a some function. Here, this function is propensity score. Choose um, subclassification on the propensity score is adjusted by this amount. I will um, give you a um, specific uh, explanation in uh, later um, slides. So here you are talking about stratification on the propensity score? Yeah, um, actually we will see there are two steps. First, stratification, and then use like a bootstrapping for the propensity score to reduce the selection bias. But the stratification is according to propensity score. You base it on, on the propensity score yeah, yeah. level. Yes, okay. If we, uh, order, if we look at the distribution from the largest, from the smallest to largest, which means our percentage score is a strictly monotone function, we can uh, use this result um, proved about 30 years by reducing this selection bias. Specifically, by using the previous uh, results for, from two previous slides, if we stratify the perfect school into five classes, five subclasses are often sufficient to remove over 90% of bias due to the subclassification variable or covariance, which means if we divide uh, the performance degree into five strata, we can reduce about 90% of selection bias. We will see later um, by looking at uh, the distribution of performance And then, this propensity score can summarize the information required to balance the distribution of covariance. So, so the subclass based upon propensity score will balance covariance. So this is the background and the theoretical support for uh, this propensity score beam bootstrapping. So in practice, five subclasses constructed from the propensity score well, enough to remove over 90% of bias due to each of the covariants. So, the, so the, this is the reason why for health economics and the other uh, non-normal distributed uh, data set, we can use this um, beam bootstrapping or um, sub-classification to address the selection bias. And is there any advantage of the bootstrap of this bin uh, bootstrapping for um, for outcomes that are normally distributed or all that? I mean, the the cost. I mean, what you are looking at is a cost, right? Yes. Which is not normally distributed. Uh, cost data usually right. are not normally distributed. Right. So. Um, the propensity score beam bootstrapping approach addresses the means adjusted for confounding factors. And, that, uh, and the one of the advantages is that they will does not make a distribution assumption, which means we don't need to uh, worry about the non-normal distribution of cost, because then does not make a distribution assumptions. And it's used, so just because of this reason, so it's useful uh, uh, for cost effectiveness analysis. So, so the procedures is like this. Compute the propensity score for the inpatient level. And then group the propensity score into five strata, equal size. And then we can uh, balance the co uh, covariant di distribution. 
So after that, why combine with both direction? Because for the cost effectiveness, health economics, health economics <coughs> we usually use both direction to estimate uh, the outcomes for cost effectiveness. So within each treatment group, both direction resampling of fixed size are drawing within each strata, which means for each subclass, we use a post direction method. And then we analyze the compared the cost, compared the compared the difference, and the calculate the um, ratio of uh, the cost divided by the effectiveness. I will see this later. Specifically, when we use the preferential support beam, um, Bootstrapping to conduct the cost effectiveness because both cost and effectiveness measure are retained from each patient selected by the resampling. And then we will calculate an incremental cost effectiveness ratio by using bootstrapping method. Because, because it, uh, for bootstrapping to calculate the answer incremental cost effectiveness ratio, even for clinical trials, we use this method. And then we can get the person, and we use this method to give like a 2.5 percent and 97.5 percent, which means the confidence is interval for the mean cost for the mean effectiveness. Okay, um, I use the we use the this propensity score beam boost matching for the health economics in answer. So in answer, the effectiveness were measured uh, by the maternal by the death MNI and stroke and converted to life year gained. Uh, the cost was estimated by using DRG code. So we use a um, propensity to go beam boost matching um, beam boost method to examine in effectiveness cost and the cost effectiveness, and we will see it in more detail. Okay, uh, Sandy didn't see the distribution of propensity score for answer last Friday. Here I just showed the numerical um, um, results. We can see that the propensity score for the, uh, uh, the whole population is about 0.45, the mean 0.44 for the median. And uh, this is the uh, basic results for propensity score by using um, mean um, propensity score, which means that we first divided all of the patients. Here, the patient is all of the all of the patients. And here we see that the estimated probability of cavity, which means for the patients who had the PCI, we also estimated the probability of getting the cabbage. And then we divided it into almost the equally five strata. And then we can see the, the, the difference for the mean propensity score, which means the propensity score function is a monotone increase. So this is for overall. And then if we look at the different group, PCI group and the cavity group, we can see the overall, as we just said, is 0 0.45, 0 0.44. And for the patient who get a cavity, the mean is about 0.65, and the PCI is about 0.29. So we can see the huge discrepancy. And um, last Friday, I put uh, this uh, distribution for different groups together by using different color. And see if we now separate this distribution of parameters to go for different groups, we can see a huge difference in distribution. Now, let's look at what's the distribution after we subclassify this parameters score. The first, uh, we look at uh, the results. So th this is the results for different groups. And uh, then after we um, subgroup this propensity score, we can see that for, uh, for B1, 
This is for the bin 2, for bin 3, for bin 4, and the bin 5. We can say after subclass is properly score, we can say this um, distribution are pretty balanced. Okay, now let's visually look at the distribution of propensity score for a different group. So this is the bin 1, this is the bin 2, this is the bin 3. And the five. So we can say that, that <coughs> the um, uh, mathematical theories proved that after um, some group, the uh, selection bias in terms of like a property score significantly reduced, reduced by about 90%. So this is uh, um, in practice, five subclasses sometimes consider is reasonable. If you like uh, use 10, the results will not be changed too much. Use two, maybe the results could be quite different. So now um, let's look at that. We get um, uh, this effectiveness. Here, as I mentioned, that the effectiveness is con convert the death and the incidence rate to quality it adjusted the knife years. And the here the cost that is uh, uh, estimated by DRG. The uh, ratio is just higher. So we can say, first that we look at the effectiveness. We can see the results from our um, raw data and then adjusted by propensity uh, score beam bootstrapping. We can see if for each for each group, the results um, uh, have some change, and we can see that comparatively, the change was smaller for PCI group. So this is for study time period, and for lifetime, we can see the similar results. So this is for the effectiveness. And then this is for the knife year, uh, knife year lost. And this is for for the cost. We can compare the results from an IPW, I mean, um, propensity group input machine, and then for the machine data set. We can see the results are comparable. And then with, um, I would like to say, this um, results for cabbage and the PCI comparatively smaller than for the data set for my match. So for the ICER, we can see some significant, uh, uh, we can see some results here. So for the ninth year from 2004 to 2008, this is the study time period, we get uh, uh, this basic answer is um, $38,000 per quality adjusted in the knife years. And then pretty close to uh, this uh, um, uh, unadjusted for the mesh data set. But a bigger um, and the results was bigger than for the quality adjusted in the knife years. So if we compare quality adjusted in the knife years by using PSPB, and then um, by using um, match the data set, we will see the results are pretty close, which means that with the sample size getting larger and larger, the results from, results from a different method should be quite close, which means the results will be stable after the sample size getting larger and larger. Okay, but the process could be quite different. See, we can see this is the um, a joint distribution of cost and the effectiveness difference. So th this is the uh, uh, effectiveness difference, and this is uh, the mean cost difference. And uh, we can see for uh, for this uh, matched data set, 
these results concentrate on this part, which means the results are more like uh, uniform, which means those two groups are it just look like a clinical trials. Yeah, so the, the right figure shows when you're using your, your inverse probability <coughs> scoring? This is a propensity score, beam boost stretching. And what's the left showing? Oh, then the left they're showing is the, show the propensity score, beam boost stretching method. What's the difference, though, between the two and methods, like methodology-wise, the graphs? Okay, and here just that they match the analytic population. Okay, and here this is just a typo. Oh. So the part B is a match the analytic population, and the part A is the SPB adjusted method. So it's just propensity score adjusted, but it's not matched? Uh, this is not a match. And okay. The, and the one on the right that is matched. Okay. Because it was matched. Okay. And for the match the data set that we used all of the patients. Okay. And here, this is for cost effectiveness uh, acceptability curve. So, so this curve is for probability score input getting adjusted. And this one is for the match the data set. We can say that for the match the data set, this process is much differently. And then, and then for this uh, propensity score, this uh, process is uh, more stable. So this is, the reason is that, um, uh, that for the match data set, we get rid of a lot of uh, um, patient population, and then make the results um, uh, reach the highest value very quickly. And for this uh, propensity score beam boost matching, beam, beam boost wrapping method, this process is much, much uh, slower. So, so uh, our final results, like uh, we mentioned here, show the similar results. But our, our graph show this process quite different. So this is, uh, uh, the way we use the propensity score beam boost matching to do the cost effectiveness analysis. I, I guess what I don't understand is that how do you get from, so you have a result you know, for each beam. We have a result of uh, How do you get from the result to each beam to a summary result? Because this is what, what you have in your life. So, so the, uh, the cost effectiveness, that's a summary result of the five beams, right? Um, not exactly. Okay, in this process of calculation, each time we we use uh, propensity score for to get a ISA. But, but an ISA for each beam? ISA for not for each beam. And oh. we have an ISA for um, get a value, and then we use the weight to um, combine and get the single beam for the whole population. So each bin has a weight. Each bin has, has a weight. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, okay. So I misunderstood. I thought you were doing the, the ISER for each bin, and then you were combining it all into some type of summary. But in fact, you don't. You, that each bin has a weight that you apply to your to, to get the combined uh, to, to combine. I see. Okay. Any other questions? Does each individual have also a weight, or is it just the bin? Um, okay, the, the two way. Yeah. Oh, okay. I had one more question on that. Okay, sure. Uh, so what are the black dotted lines? Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Okay, this is a very good question. Okay, this uh, X axis is a ISA threshold. And then the threshold means. Uh, like, uh, for example, here means $20,000 yeah, per quality adjusted life years. And here is $50,000 per quality adjusted life years. And uh, this line indicate in America currently a socially accepted threshold. Okay. Yeah, which means uh, any new drug or new procedure can save one 
quality adjusted nine for years and the cost uh, no more than fifty thousand dollars. That uh, will consider as a reasonable and acceptable. Okay. So we can see that um, in last Friday and uh, then today. I talked about how can we address selection bias in larger, in larger observational studies. So oh, on the one hand, we can do analysis by using like um, uh, measured analytic population or like uh, other weight in the way like IPW or uh, propensity score beam bootstrapping. On the one hand, Weighting approaches can capture the information from all of the patients with the balance they achieved for measured confounders by using propensity support. But on the other hand, the matched analytic population, like a one-to-one -one match, can have a better risk factor balance between the two groups. But the disadvantage is we will know the another information information from the patients. So the in better way is we conducted the two different uh, ways and then say what's the discrepancy between the results. If we can get the similar results, we would like to see the similarity of results from an weighting the method and then match the population. If we can get the similar the results are very similar and then the results from observational studies could be much more reliable and it will enhance our results as reliability. Thank you. Um, so is there, is there an advantage of the PSDB outside of a cost effectiveness analysis? Yeah. What, what could be the advantage instead of an IPW or, or uh, that will be like uh, one address the uh, distribution assumption. So, so uh, it's a distribution assumption of the outcome. Yeah, distribution right. of the outcome. Yeah. So yeah. if you have some uh, some data, um, uh, you say the distribution definitely is non uh, normalized, uh, normally distributed. So the probability um, of people stripping can provide. Uh, reliable results because uh, as I mentioned in a slide that is didn't require distribution assumption. I think uh, that's more of a comment. I think when you do match analysis and if we see a good match it's, it's like uh, testing or not testing but it's it's uh, uh, an assumption of internal validity. We say, well, mm, there yes, is good yes, internal validity. Yeah, 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 I, and I the, the, the weight, the inverse probability weighting is more for external validity, actually, if we have a, a good match, yeah. a good uh, balance. Go to balance, yeah. Is there a particular size of population that is, at which point it becomes um, useful? Okay, that, <laughs> that is hard to say because uh, because of what some size is appropriate to conduct what kind of method is always a controversial. Yeah, so um, not only the sample size, but also the overlapping number of patients. Yeah. Generally speaking, when the larger the sample size, the more likely overlapping them, including more patients for the distribution of the like, uh, in, like um, in our um, uh, synthesis study, we only we only have um, some, about 400 patients, and uh, if we do match just the 44 uh, patients in each group, the, the, the results uh, yeah, should be uh, not so reliable. Any other question? Thanks, Wei.